Good morning. On behalf of CERN's Director General, I wish you a very warm welcome to this event, marking the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web's inception, organized in partnership with the Web Foundation and W3C. Today, we will be taken on a journey spanning the past, present, and future of what has become an omnipresent tool for us all in every area of our lives. We are honored to welcome Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, alongside a number of early pioneers and leading contemporary experts. We are lucky to bring together past, present and future luminaries present in this room and watching around the world. The web weaves its magic today, allowing us all to come together wherever we are, notably with viewing parties from the US to India and from Portugal to Sweden. Before our journey begins, let us create the environment it deserves. Please keep your phones on silent mode, and if you wish to leave the room at any time, please use the doors at the back of the auditorium. Yes. If you're a Twitter user, please do tweet using the hashtag Web30. Official photographers are present in the room today to make lasting memories of the occasion, and the photographs will be uploaded in real time on the Web at 30 website, www.cern.ch forward slash Web30. If you wish to take your own pictures, you can do so, but please switch off the flash. Thank you. And now to formally open this event, please give a very warm welcome to our Director General, Fabiola Gianotti. Thank you, Anna. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, a very warm welcome also from my end to you all. And thank you for being with us today for this very special event to mark the 30th anniversary of the original proposal of the World Wide Web. 30 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee gave a short paper to some colleagues here at CERN. Behind the rather basic title of the paper, Information Management, a proposal, admittedly not super sexy, was a vision that came to transform society and the way we access information and connect at a global level. That vision became the World Wide Web. Today, we celebrate that vision and we reflect on the enormous opportunities brought by the web to society. Let me first emphasize that the story of the web highlights the power of fundamental research to drive innovation. Basic science, with its ambitious goals, brings cutting-edge technological development in many areas and can impact society in a profound way. An important part of the story of the web was a certain decision in 1993, when Carlo Rubia was Director General and Walter Hoogland Director for Research, to make it freely available to the world, royalty-free. That decision promoted the use and the further development of the web and encourage society to benefit from it. Half of the world's population is now online and close to two billion websites exist. The web has been an incredible and powerful tool to reach out to the whole humanity, to break down barriers, to bring education and information to all, and thus to reduce inequalities. This spirit of openness is one of CERN's core values, one that we strongly defend as we continue to promote the open sharing of what we develop and produce, software, hardware, data, scientific publication, for the benefit of science and of society in general. Without that core value, we will not have the open and free web that we are here to celebrate today. We are fortunate to have Sir Tim with us, along with many of the pioneers who are a are and were part of the web's journey, to hear directly from them how it all happened. But the web is far more than history. It is a reality in constant movement, still unfolding in, a, in, many, in multiple ways. As we will hear also this morning from the many experts and visionary thinkers on our panels, and they will reflect with us on the future of the web, looking ahead to the next 30 years and more. I thank all of them and all of you for coming to share this fantastic morning of reminiscence and forward thinking. Thank you.
Thank you, Fabiola. I now invite Frédéric Donc, the Internet Society's Regional Bureau Director for Europe, to join me. To begin our journey, Frédéric will take us into the past, moderating this panel discussion entitled Let's Share What We Know, with key web pioneers. Let's Share What We Know was the first motto of the World Wide Web, and on the screen you can see the first logo that marked the advent of the web. Frédéric, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Anna. Please, gentlemen, if you can follow me, Tim. Zenep, you over here? Please, hello. Here. You there? Yeah. Robert? Lou, over there. No, Jean Francois? Jean Francois? Thank you very much. Um, so, as we say, exceptional day, exceptional panel, and unfortunately, exceptional short time for this great conversation. We have 25 minutes. So, I apologize already for the bio lovers among you. I will be very quick for the introduction. And by the way, I trust that everybody on this panel is known by you. And for those of you who lived in a cave for the last 30 years, let me start with you, Zeynep Lesis, first. Zeynep Tufekci, uh, you are an associate professor at the University of North Carolina, as well as an associate at the Bergman Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard, and you write from time to time in the New York Times. Your last article on privacy is brilliant. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, so Tim, uh, well, you are the main reason for us to be seated around you on a Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock a.m., ahead of a long journey for you. Um, superlatives are missing when it's about your work. You just invented something that changed the life of billions of people out there. Uh, you invent an ecosystem for people to exchange um, access to information in a way nobody has even thought about it. Um, you have a long list of recognition and awards uh, around the world. I will skip that part. Um, you are the founding director of the World Wide Web Foundation and the director of the W3C, and you're still very active for the future of the internet. Oh, the web, sorry, and we will come back on that later. Robert, um, you are a Belgian engineer. You proposed an ARPA text um, for the same documentation in '88. And if you allow me, I would call you the evangelist of, of the web. You run the whole world to promote that technology. I will ask you why in a few minutes. Uh, we have you, uh, Jean-François, Jean-François Groff. Well, if I call Robert after the evangelist, can I call you the developer? You were uh, this young telecom engineer who just helped him develop the WWW. Um, you have a rich career, but you're mostly an entrepreneur, and you continue to be so uh, with, uh, in the digital mobile sector. Um, talking about entrepreneur, you have Lou, you, Lou, Lou Montulli. You are a serial entrepreneur. You have invented the Lynx browser. Uh, you are a founding engineer at Netscape. Uh, but you're also known as the creator of the persistent client state object known as the web cookies. And as I have a sense of humor, I have seated you next to uh, Zeynep, so you have some discussion, you, you and her, in a few seconds. Let's start. Um, Sir Tim, we are seated here on the Tuesday, 12th of March. Why? What happened so important that we all declare this is the birth of the World Wide Web? So, uh, you got the mic, if you... If you. So the... Uh, uh, so I think really the, the way to date the, the project was from this, from this memo. And the memo was one, of course, uh, we, we, I, I wrote on a, on a Mac. Uh, and in fact, I, pu I published twice with one year in between it, roughly. So, uh, so originally it was, uh, but uh, so originally I, I wrote it and, uh, and dated it March. Uh, of 1989, and then uh, and try uh, and there wasn't really anybody to give it to because it's you know, the concern is a uh, is a is a place where you can 
you could, there are lots of committees you could uh, take a proposal for a physics experiment to, but it wasn't a proposal for a physics experiment. Uh, and so, so not much happened to it. And then I put, published it again and published it with the two dates, March 1989, comma, May 1990, just to make the point that this isn't the first <laughs> time you've seen this if you're, if you're reading it. But uh, so, uh, so not a lot happened between that, but really if, you know, that was uh, at the point where I got enough energy to actually write, write it up after discussing it in sort of a coffee with, with, with people, but that's when it actually hit, a, hit the uh, hit, hit paper or hit, hit some desk and got, got a few copies printed. So, so you put this paper on the table, so what is the reaction of your colleagues, of your boss? They zip a champagne, they start dancing and celebrating, and what, what's happening? Well, so some of them, uh, so, well, the, the problem was there was nobody, nobody to send it to. I said, just send it to people, individuals. There was a, there was a uh, committee for building wonderful grand and global hypertext projects at, uh, at CERN. So, uh, but in fact, what, ha what did happen was that Mike Sandel managed to find a way for me to work on it. And uh, it's now f uh, famous th that when he's, uh, when Peggy Rimmer, his wife, went over his, uh, his things, uh, she found my copy of it, uh, she found his copy of it with, written on the corner of it, in his handwriting in pencil, vague, vague but exciting on the uh, top of the cover. And uh, so, unfortunately, Mike died. He was given, he got, to, he was diagnosed w w with cancer at about that point. And uh, so many, so that was, it was in fact, for him, that was a, a to feel very difficult. Point in his life, and he did manage to get uh, 10 years uh, uh, when he was predicted to only get five. Um, uh, and so, so the fact that Mike isn't with us is all, uh, one of the great sadnesses of, uh, of the web. But, and you have to give him huge credit for just finding a way for me to act, finding some time eventually for me to give me an excuse to, do, to do develop the thing. That's interesting. So I guess billions of people out there have a better idea of how vague it is now. Huh? But um, um, what kept you motivated? What was the big vision behind this? Well, the, so the vision, big vision was that any piece, uh, whatever computer you were using, if you made, if you typed in some, if you um, at a meeting you get, handed me some piece of paper, you'd probably type that up on a, on a word processor somewhere. So somewhere there was a disk going around and around with that uh, with with that on, and probably that computer was connected to the internet nowadays. So in 1989, that was becoming more acceptable in Europe to to uh, to do this use these American internet protocols. And so, if that was the case, then why couldn't I just why couldn't you serve it up to the internet so that I could find it over the net? And, the, and the, I think the exciting thing about hypertext, because hypertext is just this random, potentially random web of things, is the, 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 if you could produce a hypertext web, then any existing system could be mapped into it. Whether if, a, if the system was a, was a matrix, then you couldn't represent that in hypertext. If the system was a tree, you can represent that. So that's, why, that's partly why hypertext was uh, Key. And hypertext was a sort of cool thing at the time, but it was one of these. And computing, it was very fringe. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no, there was no comp dot sys dot hypertext. There was cop, there was alt. Uh, all news group was an alternative news group for the weirdos. Uh, so the alt dot hypertext was where this, these things were discussed. So, um, so uh, uh, that's uh, that was that the... it was hypertext and the internet. Sort of coming together, which, which seemed to be uh, a relatively, relatively simple idea, mm -hmm. uh, but and and I think as, so once you've seen the possibility of all of these things being part of one big like one big book, then it's just frustrating. Then just you know what can can be um, motivated when you can visualize what it could be like. Exactly. And it hasn't happened yet. You just have to keep working on it. Okay, which is an transition to you, Robert. I mean, a simple idea, but there were plenty of ideas out there, right? There were Gopher, there were a lot of different ideas. But then you, you saw something in Tim's work and you said, that's the one. And you became what I call the eventualist. So how comes you saw it suddenly that it would be the one? Well, um, 
Let's say that um, there were indeed uh, a lot of systems out there, and that there were quite a lot of uh, much more advanced hypertext systems as well, but they were all confined to a single machine. And so uh, what this did, uh, and I was working on it as well, which is why Mike gave me the, the, the copy, and uh, when I read it, uh, I knew that that was that was what was lacking, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I needed no further convincing. In, in, in fact, I then went to see you, uh, uh, because we, we were in offices that were at least a kilometer apart inside, so, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's when it started. So uh, it was sort of um, like, uh, if I may make a, a physics uh, analogy, it was like uh, dropping a crystal in an undercooled liquid, and suddenly, you know, it goes. Uh, I like this. And, yeah. and that's, uh, that's what happened. Um, but was there something that you saw, a DNA in, in this World Wide Web, that you thought, yes, this one will scale? Well, perhaps just the idea that, that it went over a worldwide network, that it was, the network was sort of secondary to it, but it, it was everywhere. Okay. It was not proprietary also, which was very important. I agree. And then we come to you, uh, this young telecom engineer who just come here in the CERN. So how, how were you attracted to work precisely in, in that stuff? Yeah, it, it was quite uh, being in the right place by accident. Uh, <laughs> I, I came to CERN thanks to the CERN military service. Uh, <laughs> I was, a, I was a young French engineer from a telecom school and, and France did have a strong tradition of, of telecom and especially digital telecom. So when I met Tim at the initiation of uh, Ben Siegel, who had introduced the internet at CERN just a year before, mm -hmm. um, I saw what Tim was programming and the brilliant thing about this guy is that he could not only express the vision in words, but you could actually code it and make it work. So that's a very, let's say, Californian attitude that Tim had, despite his British heritage. So, and I think that's why he became uh, this, this celebrated hero today. So anyway, I saw what he was doing, and, and we talked a lot about the design concepts. It was really fresh. Uh, and at one point he said, yeah, but, well, you understand what I'm doing? I said, yeah, of course, it's obvious. It's one of these ideas, once you see it in action, it's so obvious, like everybody can just click, of course. But when we talked, as Robert said, to the experts of hypertext, they thought our system was really junk. We were rejected from international conferences. And people, and the experts who understood the impact of the web said, oh my God, you're gonna break the internet the bandwidth will never follow. And I'm still amazed today that bandwidth has not only followed, but preceded the needs. Like everybody has four video streams at home for, for a really trivial amount of money. And we're busy connecting the other half now. We have about four billion people connected. We're gonna have the other half connected in the next two or three years. It's absolutely incredible. Okay, but I'm glad that you mentioned Tim as a cool Californian inventor because honestly, I, I know where I'm talking time. today. Um, <laughs> uh, we are in CERN. We, we could have imagined that such an invention would come from your part of the world, Lou. I mean, in California, next to a garage of Steve Jobs. So why CERN? Is, was CERN the ecosystem for an invention for the web? Tim, what do you think? I think there were certain, yeah, looking back, I think there were certain particularly neat things about CERN. Uh, the fact that and the problem I described, it had in spades. So it had much more heterogeneity. Uh, it, it, there was no military rule as to who, what, that everybody should use the IBM. Actually, you could use the CDC, you could use the Cray. And so there were all these different systems because you were allowed to come from a university using the, the university, using the computers that you liked in your group at university. So that was partly, uh, so that it had a very, very d dire need for interoperability uh, for, for uh, information at the same time. Also, for the early adopters, they had the smartest workstations because they needed to be able to do analysis and display and, uh, and so on. They, had, they were some of the first people to actually have Unix workstations 
uh, or for a typical you know, physicist would have a Unix workstation on their desk, uh, connected to the internet. So in fact, they had the power to be, a, be a, the, one of the few people who could have been early adopters of, uh, uh, and also had, a, had the dire need. So to a certain extent, as a petri dish for the, you know, the mold of the, of the World Wide okay. Web to grow, this is a pretty good one. Okay, but, but, but just between you and I, um, um, were there any resistance in, in, in the CERN? Was it spice and sugar everywhere, or there were some, some resistance? I must say there was some going around the experiments. Of course, I'd go to each of the experiments and, and suggest, hey, you should, you should put other stuff on the web, and there were some. Uh, and, and, uh, so, uh, some, uh, some people were not convinced, and some were convinced. Paul Kunz, uh, by the way, was somebody who came over from California, from Slack, got it immediately. He was worried that it would take too long to operate over the internet, so he logged in using his next computer. He logged into the next computer at Slack, it was on his desk, and he did a and, and he loaded a CERN web page from it there, and then he went and he said, "Wow!" It even happened. If I got twice across the Atlantic, it still works as as fast as I need to. So he was convinced, and I have to say that for, that the, uh, the, just the one story is that Paul took me back when I went back to SAC. He took me around a few people that he'd tried to convince about the web. And he took me into the office and just said, "You know, I'm just." I won't say who their names were, uh, but, he, but he, that's the only time I've ever seen anybody sort of rub it in. By the way, you know, didn't, you know, uh, it, it did work in the end. But uh, lots and lots, you, know, you have to uh, respect people who decided that it was, uh, who, who didn't use it, because it, uh, okay. it, uh, it, it was a bit random. But also, uh, and also physicists always prefer to write their own code rather than use anybody else's. <laughs> Before I switch to, to you, Lou, I, I got the non-politically correct question, and, and that is, um, um, if you guys had decided to patent this web, you, you, you would own the CERN right now, right? I mean, you would be no. super rich. What Wouldn't happened work. for you? Wouldn't work. Wouldn't Why? Work. Um, one of the key reasons the web dominated uh, all the equivalent information systems that were being developed at the time. Well, there were two reasons. One of them, it's a brilliant system. It still works today. You, you, we recreated the World Wide Web browser a, few, a couple of weeks ago, and it speaks to current servers, and it just works. So that, that was a brilliant design. Thank you, Tim. But also, uh, that system was made purposely totally open. So CERN already made all their software public, uh, and in addition to the standard CERN license, uh, Robert managed to get CERN, the Director General Carlo Rubia at the time, to sign off so that the web technology, the foundational technology, would be public domain, which is the, the highest shareable thing you can imagine uh, from a legal Thank standpoint. You for this, yeah. And without that, industry told us we had you know, people in suits coming to CERN and talking with Tim and telling him, hey, you know, we love your invention. We want to build plenty of products around this. We had Adobe coming, DEC coming, IBM coming. But we, you know, what are going to be the usage conditions? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was extremely important that we make it absolutely open. It was also in the early 90s, the, the, the movement towards open source was just starting. When we published the web in August 91, uh, Linus Torvalds published the 0.1 version of Linux also in August 91, mm. so it, it was in the air. It would have happened elsewhere as well. Yeah, so while I was writing code, Robert spent a lot of time lobbying, just uh, lobbying the CERN directorate, trying to get that piece of paper, which now is you know, on the web with a red stamp on it, and is uh, in 1993. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the, uh, then 10 years later, the Web Consortium as a whole made a declaration that they, would have, they, they created the, web, the WCC patent policy, which made sure that everything that came through the standards body would also be royalty free after they got caught in a trap by somebody who tried to ambush them and hold the whole, uh, the, the, the whole technology world to, to, uh, to ransom. So very, yeah, the openness for very important. And thanks, okay. Robert, for, all, for, for, well, thank you. for running for that this. down. Crossing the Atlantic, Lou, so w what did you do on this web of March? I mean, what happened to you? You start working on this web, you saw something. <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, well, the, uh, the web as I knew it, I didn't know about it, because I didn't come along and actually discover the 
the genius that it was for almost three, three or four years later. And I'd been working for about a year on my project Lynx, which was uh, networked hypertext, so the, the idea was in the air. Uh, but when I first saw the World Wide Web, and I read your paper, Tim, I recognized that there was just deep thought in what you had done, and you had, you had made it freely available, so that the idea was anyone could adopt the technology. And I made the hard decision to kind of abandon the code that I had written and adopt all the standards that you had created. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, uh, Mosaic kind of came out at, at a, a very similar time. And it created an ecosystem of products. And that was, I think, one of the real big secrets here is the openness and the inclusion. Yes. Uh, and the genius of the URL. Uh, at the, in the early days of the internet, 99.99% of the content was everywhere else. You had Gopher, you had FTP, and you had a lot of other systems. And the web embraced all that. And it put a really slick user interface on it. And it allowed the average person to just start clicking and getting to that information and not having to worry about 192.168.1 mm -hmm. and all of the other minutia that, uh, that the internet was at the time. And it became the great enabler. And then as more and more people yes. saw the, the, the genius that the, uh, the web was, and th they were only able to see it because more and more products were coming out. And it's because of that openness. If it had been a closed system, if one company was doing it, they couldn't possibly have built all of the technology and the browsers and the, the many, many things that created the ecosystem that built this juggernaut. Exactly. That, that, that's the power of open source, of, of open software. And uh, I was amazed that how organically the, the world of data grew around uh, the web basic principles. Because anybody who had a database of something uh, could easily write a web server that would convert all this on the fly to HTML and just display it over the world, even though we had very slow, by today's standards, very slow lines. I had two megabit per second. That was you know, the fastest in Europe. But it grew, it grew so much. And one thing that amazed me is that uh, uh, we didn't expect that so many people would be eager to learn uh, the language, the coding language of the web, uh, learning HTML for us, it should never have been seen by ordinary people. This was dirty stuff just for, you know, plumbers like we guys. But people loved to tinker with HTML, and that's why they rejected uh, the, the uh, nice Visivig editors that, that Tim and other people had built, because they liked to tinker. And that was really an, an enlightening experience. I agree. Uh, well, that DNA openness is also the weakness, I believe, of the web. Zeneb, uh, what are the challenges that you see for this open platform? And so you got three minutes for this. Okay, so three minutes for So the challenges come from the same things that make it wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that's the difficulty. And it is, the openness is wonderful, the connectivity is wonderful. The fact that it was created as a network more for academics who are kind of trusting each other, all of those things made it scale. But at the same time, sort of just to count off all the challenges, it's increasingly centralizing. Mm -hmm. Because the next couple billion, they're not tinkering, they're on Facebook and they're going through Google. So there's an enormous amount of centralization going on with a few big players becoming gatekeepers. Those few big players have built basically surveillance machines. Um, the cookie helps. <laughs> but even as useful as it may be. I told you, I... Uh, <laughs> so, we're being surveilled in all sorts of ways because of the way the centralization has fused with the financing model because it's based on surveillance profiling us and then targeting for us for ads, which wasn't the original idea at all. I was there in the early days. That wasn't the, um, the magic of it wasn't that, but now it's going there. Um, in other ways, the financing model becomes an issue because a lot of us academics, we don't think of the money side and who's going to pay for the servers, and eventually somebody's going to pay for servers, and eventually somebody's going to make money from that surveillance. So that's been, I think, a big challenge. And that has made our consent less and less useful because you, know, you do anything and you get just swept into all of these things. And 
it's splintering, right? China is having its kind of internet. And if, even if you're in the West, Facebook is a kind of internet. And a lot of people, for them, that's mm -hmm. the internet. If you're in Indonesia, that's the internet. And finally, because it was a trusted network, it didn't have certain kinds of verification, authentication built into it, which means spoofing, misinformation, you know, fake and real. These are all things that come from the things that also make it wonderful. So, but we have to think about these things because they're very real. Thank you, Zeneb. That's a good teaser for the next session. So stay connected. So we will address this at the next session. Uh, staying with you. Uh, just one sentence. Yes. What would you tell the next generation about how to use this wonderful tool? One sentence. So my one sentence to next generation is if you have something wonderful, if you do not defend it, you will lose it. If you do not defend the magic and the things that make it wonderful, it's just not going to stay magical by itself. Thank you. Lou? Working on the web. Working on the web gave me something to believe in, something to be part of that was bigger than myself. And I would say to everyone out there looking for something, engage in something bigger than yourself. Believe in something, and you can change the world. Thank you. Jean-François? We didn't think we would change the world in a social way, but we, we did believe this would get big. It, it went even bigger than we imagined, and uh, I'm forever grateful for having been here by chance at the right time. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Robert? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> get off it and save the planet. <laughs> I'm so surprised. <laughs> save the planet. We have, no, we have only one important thing to do, that is to save our planet. That's, that's the biggest problem that we have to deal with and yes. the web can help that and I was very uh, confident that uh, it would be a good tool to, to do so and to bring people together and, and in a sense it is of course but we're not doing enough for this paramount problem that we're seeing and, and that, that I think is much more important than, than anything including this whole session yeah. unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Tim, the last word for you. So, yes, climate change is important, uh, and a lot, of the, the, a lot of the things we have, big, massive challenges, uh, like finding cures for cancer and understanding Alzheimer's and so on, and these, put the, these challenges we should be able to use the web for. We should, you know, the idea was that it should be a big collaborative medium which will allow us to do science, do, rev do peer review, do... Uh, go through processes like Wikipedia processes, which end up producing not perfection, but pretty, but but things which are really, really uh, amazingly good. Uh, uh, things like the product of all, of the record of, of scientific knowledge and uh, and so on. Uh, we uh, we. I think people feel that we used to have the press as, and, uh, as producing a, a pretty good, reliable record of, of what's been going on out there, but now on the web, it's, uh, uh, people are worried about it not being, uh, being re reliable. So what I say, if you, if you, what I would suggest is you, uh, you should look at, uh, realize that humanity needs to figure out what to believe and then figure out what to do. For figuring out what to believe, we have science, really important facts. And we have things like Wikipedia on the web. For figuring out what to do, we have democracy. As Winston Churchill said, it sucks, but it's the West. We haven't got anything better than democracy. So we have got systems on the web which harness people together to, uh, to search for truth and facts. We don't have such good systems out there yet that harness people together in the search for uh, good decisions. For the where, where can you go to have a good, open, recountable political debate where you will end up leaving a bread, trail of breadcrumbs of, of facts and argued, logical, respectful decisions. So build systems for us to use for our political systems, for our decision making, communal decision making and add those to the systems and improve the systems that we have for our communal fact making. So science is uh, not just the science but also democracy. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. It was more. Thank you. It, it was more than one sentence, but you'll be forgiven for today, exceptionally. Um, 
Gentlemen and ladies, please help me clapping this wonderful panel. So, without transition, um, because we're a little bit late, I apologize. Um, um, for a week in February, a group of developers came to CERN and they have something interesting to, to share. So I guess we have a video now. Thank you. So we came to CERN this week in order to create some sort of modern day interpretation of the very first uh, web browser. So the project is to restore the first browser which was uh, developed by the inventor of the web and the idea is to recreate an experience for the people who could not uh, use the web in its early days to have an idea how it felt to use the web at that time. I think the biggest difficulty was to make uh, the browser work in the, in the next machine that we had. We really needed to work with, a, with an original um, next box in order to really understand what that experience was like, um, in order to be able, be able to write some code um, to replicate that experience. So my role is uh, code, so generating the code to create the interactive aspect of the uh, um, the World Wide Web browser, recreated browsers. So it's very much writing JavaScript to kind of create all the the next operating system kind of UI, um, making requests to servers to go and get the HTML and and massage the HTML back into a format that looks good in this uh, the World Wide Web browser, um, and making sure that we actually end up with a a URL that goes into production that people can come and visit and and see their own web pages and the, the tangible software uh, is what I'm responsible for so I have to make sure it all gets done uh, otherwise we have no no browser to look at basically we got together a few years back to do a similar sort of hack project here at CERN, which was creating the world's second ever web browser, which was the Line Mode browser. Uh, and we had a lot of fun with it, and it's a great bunch of people from all over the world. So it's been really great to get back together, and it's always amazing to be here at CERN, to be at not just the birthplace of the web, but you know, the most important place on the planet for science. Uh, and yeah, it's just been a lot of fun and I kind of don't want it to be over because uh, we're, we're in our element, hacking away, having fun and just soaking up the atmosphere. And we're getting to chat with people who were there 30 years ago, you know, Jean-Francois Croft and Robert Caillou, these people who were involved in the creation of the World Wide Web. But, uh, to me, that's amazing to be, you know, surrounded by so much uh, World Wide Web history. So the plan is that uh, this will go online and anyone will be able to access it because it's on the web and that's the beautiful thing about the web is that anyone can, can visit a website. And so everyone will have the opportunity to try using the world's first web browser and maybe see what uh, modern web pages would look like if they were passed through this uh, first web browser. An inspiring retrospective indeed. And in fact, three of those developers, along with representatives of the US mission, are actually with us here today. Thank you very much to them.
from the past, we now return to the present with all the challenges and opportunities it presents for the web. It's my pleasure to introduce the curator of TED Global and president of the International Film Festival and Forum on Human Rights, Bruno Giussani. Bruno will be spending the next 20 minutes or so in conversation with Sir Tim to get an insight into his thoughts and aspirations for his invention as it embarks on its fourth decade. They have kindly invited us to listen in. Bruno. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when uh, we, those of us who follow Sir Tim, please join me. <laughs> those of us who follow Sir Tim and his activities and his voice and his writings uh, have probably noticed uh, something interesting. There are actually two Sir Tims right now. One who is kind of uh, uh, a bit disappointed and very worried about the web, where the web uh, got after 30 years, starting with uh, potential for expansions of freedoms and ended up in a different world. And the other was trying to fix it, uh, or figure out ways to fix it. And so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about those two things. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, Tim, you, you said recently uh, in an interview something that really uh, remained with me. Uh, there is a lot of good in the, in, the, in the web, of course, but you said this. The web is becoming a large-scale, and I quote, a large-scale emergent phenomenon which is anti-human. That's really hard wording. Uh, when, when did you realize that it was time for you to kind of step back and take a second look at your creation? Uh, you have to check the quote, but I think what I said was we have to be careful. Uh, we need to constantly be analyzing the web and how, it's, and how people interact on it. Uh, to be, or, uh, because of what I'm worried about is that there should be a large-scale emergent phenomenon. Uh, that there should be sort of like, like the financial system works fine, and then one day it crashes, uh, and like uh, Chinese society sort of uh, worked for, for fine for some definition, fine, and then at one point they had a cultural revolu revolution, uh, which seemed went, and suddenly uh, uh, changed very dramatically, and that sort of so there are, uh, like, like you could get uh, like a, a, a super, <laughs> super something super cool or super heated will will look fine, and then it suddenly suddenly change. Could that happen? One of the concerns is that could happen on the web socially. Could you go to see one day and uh, find that when you wake up? that there has been a social revolution, that uh, there has been a conspiracy theory which has taken over the entire web uh, overnight very, very quickly, and that all, uh, and there is now a, a, a trend for uh, completely distrusting all the old authorities, that sort of thing. So that was the sort of thing I thought we should have people doing math to find out, you know, to model the way people interact, and we should, and, uh, um, we should, do, uh, um, we should measure and check you know, what, how people, how if you put people together, uh, we should find out how they work, how they function, and then project with mathematics how they work on large scale. That was the sort of thing so, that, so Zenep, behind that. Zenep Tufeshki in the panel before said, what creates the problem is also what makes the web wonderful. It's openness, it's uh, uh, capacity to connect uh, everywhere and uh, everybody, etc. cetera. Uh, but I have the impression that maybe the key reason why we got where we got uh, today with all this set of problems uh, is the fact that uh, mostly at the center of all the business models of the web, there is data, particularly personal data. Uh, and you seem to be starting from there to look at it in a, in a different way. So I want to touch upon two things. There are technology fixes and there are political fixes. Maybe we can start with, uh, with uh, the tech fixes first. Uh, you, you, you are launching into uh, a, a project. You launched several years ago into a project to re-decentralize the web. Tell us about what does, what, what does it mean, re-decentralizing the web? OK, so let's start off then with the vision of the World Wide Web when it started off. And thanks, by the way, that was an amazing project, reproducing the browser. Do you notice the browser, so the original web browser was a read-write browser. The idea was you'd be working on a project, and any time that you 
you, you saw something that somebody else, had, an idea that somebody else had put in there, you could absorb it. But also, if you had an idea, like a connection between two things, you could say, oh, if you're interested in that, you should be interested in that. You could make a link, hit save, save all, save all the things back, and very quickly, you'd added data to it. So first of all, there's the difference between the read-only web and the read-write web. An important part of it for me was that it, that it should be a read-write web. And then, you know, originally, it was kind of decentralized because people, somebody at CERN could just put, you know, an experiment could fire up a, the, their own web server, and so in principle, you, everybody could have their own web server where they could be their own publisher, but also have their own read-write space. So the need to be able to interact uh, wasn't really. You know, in fact, when browsers, the, the browsers people used, took off, they weren't weren't editors. So how did people interact? So what happened is we ended up with this sort of web. 2.0, as people called it, well, you know, we didn't have official numbering systems, but what people, the press called Web 2.0, was a web where you have, you go to websites and you fill in forms and you tell your social network, oh, that's me in that photo, uh, or that, you know, I, I like this because of this, and you would, and so, bit by bit, you would put data in, and the data, you, yes, you could write blogs, but what was captured in user-generated content, UGC, when in that phase of the web, was people were actually capturing important semantic data. So they, didn't, so they didn't just know that you were interested in the photo, they knew who was in the photo. That was very val valuable data. People, it, it was from people. So how can you imagine a world in which it's decentralized, we don't have to rely on a centralized database. Uh, so imagine that we have a world wh where you are running apps, you're running web, web apps, or they can be other apps. You can be managing your photos, managing your contacts, managing your calendar, uh, yes. whatever it is. And, imagine, and the data, instead of you combine the user-generated content idea of being able to input value to the system with the everybody has their own web page, idea, website, website idea, and so you say, yes, I will generate data, but it'll go onto my website. So, so that is the uh, that's a sort of that, that that's the idea behind it. So solid, your your, solid. your answer to the question is actually a specific project. It's called Solid, which which has data as its center. Solid stands for social linked data. Uh, it's a it's a it's a way to to to, to free data from. Well, it used control, to. Right? Yeah, it just it's. Uh, uh, it used to stand for social linked data, it doesn't anymore, it's just solid. Okay, it's just yeah. solid. We just yeah. go for the acronym, perfect. Uh, but explain the tech behind solid, what they're trying to imagine. So this notion that I, I control and, 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 and own my, own my data, uh, how, how do we bring the data back to, to, to the user? Well, it's, it's, it's solid is certainly not rocket science. Uh, it's not even particle physics science. It's very, it's very, it's, very. Afterwards, it's just the web. That, yes. it's, it's just the web, but we're using the. But it's the web with a few things added to it. First of all, it has. Uh, you can't do collaboration really. The reason why it, the web didn't become one of the main reasons why it didn't become a big read-write web is if you're sharing stuff, if you're inputting data, you need to do it within a group. You need to be able to protect it. So, for, and for that. You need, uh, author, you need to have authentication and authorization. And so Solid gives everybody the ability to have one or more uh, IDs. So first of all, it gives you a global ID, gives you a single login across all the, the Solid compatible systems. So and when you've got your ID, then that means that you can get, if you give, give me your business card, uh, and it's got your web ID on it from Solid, then I can go back home, I can take pictures of, of you and I can go back home and I can give you access to it. All I need to know is your ID. Any time you log onto my systems, I can, you can leave a trace of your ID so I can use that to build a group, I can use that to, to build, uh, uh, so it's, uh, I can use that to build, put into the access control of uh, my Solid system and share anything with you. So the idea of Solid is it's very, it's a bit like uh, it actually, it's a bit like a Unix system. So if you're, if you're using a Unix mainframe, everybody, there are files, and there are users, and there are groups. And users have, short, have names, which are short names. Solid is like the Unix system, except instead of a short name of a user, it's a URL. So the URL, the user can be anywhere on the web. A group has a name, which is a URL. So the group can be anywhere on the web. A file, 
we already have those on the web. They have, uh, they have URLs, and then the access control for the file can allow any combination of groups and users to be, get access to the file. Really simple. It's just really like the whole web is one great big Unix system, and on it you have you know, group permissions and individual permissions, and then you can write apps. So as a developer, you write, basically it's like writing Unix apps. You, re you read and write data, you set up permissions, and you build collaborative software. All right, so it's... Um. Sounds it's not so obvious, but it's not obvious at all. Really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a flip because, yeah, it's yeah, all the technology is really simple. All the ideas are just Unix, but when you separate the apps, you see when you write an app, you don't store the data. When you write an app, you ask just the fact that the developer then asks the user, which the program asks the user where that is going to store. They want the data stored, so that means that you give complete control of choice. And of you the can user as well as store it. The data that, so, that is, yeah. it's a, so that change to separate the apps from the data is it's technically n n not really, really, really very hard, but it's a massive change socially. Because right now, the app and data are actually very, very connected. I mean, there is no way to move from a big platform to another big platform easily because the data are so connected and structured for that specific uh, app. So it's a, it's a way of giving autonomy to, to, to data in a, in, a, in a way. Now, uh, at what point is the development of the technology? I assume that it's not ready for general use. So you it's still not ready for general use, or you'll be using it already. But uh, if you're a developer, so we've got a bunch of open source uh, software. There is a the, uh, there are a couple of servers. One that is uh, functional. It's called Node Solid Server. If you are interested and you're a developer, then do get involved. Do find the Solid Project on uh, GitHub. Uh, do find the Gitter channels where we chat and uh, and jo join us there and help us. Uh, there's a lot of um, we're using basic web standards, but also there are a lot of uh, standards we need to make for all of the interoperability between the applications. So we need common formats for, for we've got common formats for contacts, we need com common formats for events and, and uh, talks and all kinds of things. Now, there is a whole movement uh, called uh, decentralized web and that Solid is part, is part of. Uh, you know, there is a decentralized web summit. There are alternatives that are decentralized to Twitter and to YouTube and others. Uh, I guess that if it was an easy thing, many people would be using that. And instead, only a few people are using these, these apps. Uh, when do you think we're going to get to the point where we are going to start you know, as normal users using the decentralized web? Uh, so I'm, uh, I've been very strictly told that I should never give a date for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, for two reasons, I, I think partly because things always take longer than you think. Uh, the other is that there are people, you know, we have quite a lot of developers, we, we didn't really tell anybody about it very much, mm -hmm. but when we turned the interrupt.com website on, there was didn't, you know, didn't have a website until uh, last October, and within, uh, we turned it on uh, the, on a Friday by the end of the weekend. We had, uh, I think, 30,000 users on uh, each of the two systems, which we we on uh, on solid.community and interrupt.net. So there are people uh, who are playing with it, even though we told them not to. And so it's possible that, uh, and we hope that they're all developers, we hope they're all going to help code. Uh, and so projects like the, 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 the hackathon you, you guys had uh, will be very much in order. Uh, but it's possible that at any point that some small community of people who find that Sonic actually works well, really well for them will just take off and start using it. Okay. There is another aspect which is less technical uh, about fixing the current situation, and it is uh, social and political in a way. Uh, with Web Foundation and, and, and your collaborators and many other people, you have developed this notion of a contract for the web. Uh, so tell us about, about that. What is the contract for the web? So the contract for the web is something that we're, we're taking advantage of, the, of this. Of two, it's triggered by two things. The, the 30 years is one excuse, if you like, for s stepping back and looking at it. But also it happens to coincide with this point where 50% of humanity is now using this web thing. So at that point as well, you've got to step back and look. And so what the Web Foundation has done is say, well, there are, there's only two things to do. <laughs> One is get the other half online as quickly as possible, of course, because it is becoming more and more, uh, more, and more unfair 
that they aren't. Uh, and the other is, for the people who are online, whoops, the web is not the, same, the web we wanted in every respect. So work really, really hard to keep it open and free like we always have, keep it net, 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 you know, fight for net neutrality, but also uh, uh, think about other aspects, privacy, think about owning uh, control of your own data, think uh, about where, how social networks really should control hate speech and where that should fit in with free speech. Think about if we are going to uh, implement end-to-end -end encryption for everything, then how are, so how are social networks going to try to prevent themselves being used for, uh, for very, very malicious uh, instigation of genocide, for example? There are lots of, the, there are some really easy things out there uh, when it comes to making the web, the web we want. Yeah, no, freedom, net neutrality, more connect, more bandwidth. You can always shout for more bandwidth, more reliability, more inclusion. You need to share also, when you look at, uh, you also need to um, make sure that, uh, but, but when, when you look at the other, um, the other half of it, uh, uh, you think it's, you know, it's very simple. Well, the first thing you shout for is, uh, is that it should be more affordable. The simplest thing for just to go for is affordability because it's affordability of phones and the affordability of network connections which has sort of driven the gro this growth to 50%. But also there are, comp there are uh, other things which you really wouldn't have thought of in the, the, like the fact that women, uh, men are 24% more likely to use the web than women, uh, for example. Things, things, other things need to be fixed in that part. So just to, just to go briefly back to the contract, this is how to connect to the next, next half, which is a big, a big element, but uh, the contract is a set of principles, right? It's a sort of bill of rights for the web, in a way. Uh, it's, it's a contract it's a contra it starts with five it starts with with nine principles and that's the easy bit in a yeah. way the, the the idea behind the contract is the three groups that need to need to do things they need to they a lot of them are figuring out what to do now governments and, and large companies are to a certain extent all uh, realize that, that they there are things they need to do to fix the web uh, and to be uh, to be good uh, responsible participants in the web, and individuals as well. So we, the contract is the contract between three groups, individuals, uh, governments, and companies. And those who sign up basically self-commit to adhere to those principles, in a way. If, uh, if you sign up, you're saying, yeah, 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 those principles are really important, of course, duh. But I want to be part of the, the, of the details. Well, the contract for the web is about sitting down in working groups with uh, with other people who've signed up, and to say, okay, so let's work out what this really means. Where, how are we actually going to, where's the balance between leaving the tech companies to do the right thing and regulating them? Where's the balance uh, b between freedom of speech and, and hate speech? Things like, uh, things like that. So it's a, the contract is, it's not a written in stone thing. The contract for the web, uh, Phenomenon is one of people signing, uh, saying, "Yes, I think, I, I think this stuff is important, and I want to be involved with the discussions to work out the details." So the creator of the web creating a movement to save the web uh, in a in a in a way. Uh, Don't Timon, you um, have to do that? Yeah, yeah. but you know. Tim, I'm very mindful of that. You need to take a catch a plane in a, in a few minutes. So uh, we are sending you off on a on a trip. Uh, and the trip is about 30 hours for the 30th anniversary of the web. So at 8 a.m. we started this event, and it was the beginning of a period of 30 hours uh, when uh, Timmy is going to now travel to London. Uh, the idea is CERN is the origin of the web. Uh, London symbolizes like the web of today, connected, global. Uh, and then from London, where there is another event planned for tonight at the Science Museum, he's going to travel to Lagos, Africa, where the other half of the web, uh, mostly the other half, the future half of the web that's not connected yet uh, is symbolically, meaning mostly in Africa and Asia and in other emerging parts of the world. There is also an hour by an hour kind of play in this 30 hours. So we can so follow starting at 8 o'clock this morning. Yeah. Yes. Uh, each hour. So it's 8 o'clock in the morning, you should think about what you were doing in 1989. 
if you want to tweet about that, like you could do in the, you've got to do that in about the next 30 seconds. So now is the time to tweet about what you were thinking, what you were doing with the web in 1989, and then in, uh, and then back. And that it's okay if you're slightly inaccurate. But then, and then, the, then we will have an hour thinking about what uh, thinking 1990. about 1990 and so on as uh, as we go through this 30 hour, and we'll be. Traveling, actually traveling to London and then to Lagos during that time. Uh, you can just tweet. That's, I know. Yeah. Or, or follow. Simple. Or follow. <laughs> we're going to send you off with a present. And, uh, and we're going to give you, we're going to give it to you in, a, in, a, in an interesting form. But first, I want to have the audience listen to the digital version of it for a few seconds. Can we just play the clip? So, uh, Domenico Vicinanza, who's a former CERN physicist and music composer, and his partner Genevieve Williams from the University of Exeter, took your original memo uh, from 1989 and uh, created this song, which lasts three minutes in the full version uh, around it, basically around the idea of connecting information and how do you turn that into music. Now, the full three minutes will be up on the event website, so we can all listen to it. And we want to give it to you as a, as a gift. They made it for you. But of course, they made it based on a 1989 document. And so we're going to give it to you the way we would have given it to you in 1989. And that's what Hannah has in her hands. <laughs> 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 going to be leaving now. Thank you, Tim. So. Safe trip. Thank you. Tim Berners Lee. OK, we're going to go out this way. OK? Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. It was a joy. Really, delight. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. It was Melissa. Melissa the tyranny all of, us, of airplane schedules. Uh, Enjoy it's a real Walkman from 18, uh, 1989 with a real cassette uh, uh, taping inside, and uh, that song recorded. You can all listen to the full song, which starts literally from you know the single server, so the single instrument, which is a piano, and then builds up as the web develops and as information uh, gets uh, uh, connected and uh, linked. I also need to mention that uh, uh, Domenico and Genevieve worked with somebody here at CERN uh, to realize that, and that's Maria Dimu, whom I also uh, thank. Now, uh, the next uh, uh, session is called Towards the Future, and of course, we can look at the future in many different ways. There is a, a bleak version of the future, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, you know, the web has become a technology that can potentially enable very terrible uh, human uh, instinct. Uh, as we heard before, uh, even Tim is very uh, concerned about the big potential for harm. Uh, but of course, uh, there is also a, a better version of the future, uh, one where uh, you know, there is no uninventing technologies and there is no going back, but there is uh, fixing uh, that, uh, that can uh, uh, be done. The web and the internet we have is not the only web that we can have. So what is uh, the uh, different one that we can uh, imagine? And I have four guests to discuss <coughs> this during the next 45-something uh, uh, minutes. Uh, and I invite them on stage, uh, please. So the first is Doreen Bogdan-Martin. Since last November, she uh, is the director of the Telecommunication Development Unit at the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU. 
Doreen, please join me. Uh, then we have Jovan Kurbalia, whose background is an intersection of diplomacy and uh, technology. Welcome, Doreen. Uh, and his most recent role is executive director or secretariat for the UN high-level panel on digital cooperation. Then Monique Morrow. Uh, she's the president and co-founder of uh, the Humanized Internet and uh, uh, president of the Vetri Foundation. Those are two organizations based in Switzerland who f which focus on digital identity, privacy, and blockchain. And then we're going to get uh, Zeynep Tufeczki back. Uh, she was in the first panel, uh, and uh, uh, we're going to ask her to complete or extend her analysis during uh, this panel. Thank you for uh, joining me. And we have a fifth participant in this panel uh, who cannot be here for reasons that will be immediately evident, but he's going to give a short introduction speech. Let's watch. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool, though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. No, it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, <laughs> when you think then about the Is future, there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But yeah. that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment where the interplay between the user and the provider will be so in simpatico, it's going to, it's going to crush our ideas of what m mediums are all about. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> so David Bowie passed away three years ago, but of course he's already foreseen some of the problems uh, of, uh, of today. We have developed the potential of the web to really spectacular heights, but at the same time, we have not taken enough uh, care in mitigating the risks or uh, eliminating them. So I want to talk a little bit about this and about uh, how we go and where we go from uh, here. Uh, but uh, uh, Zeynep, I want to start with you because you were in the previous panel, so we use you as a, as a link between the two panels. Uh, <laughs> Four years ago, the New Yorker magazine published an article by you and was part of a series with other uh, authors as well. Uh, and they asked you to describe your first experience with the Internet. And you described it this way. It came as a diskette. The program activated a modem, a second of silence, and then the scratchy explosive sound that signaled that my computer had connected to the network of networks. I spent the next week in a daze, barely moving from my monitor in the glowing window that it has just opened onto the world world. The whole world. End of quote. And that world was the web, and actually later in the article you mentioned the CERN homepage as one of the first destinations. Uh, I have heard a similar story from Johan the other day when we spoke. It talk about a magical moment of getting into the, the web. And I suspect many of us here can tell versions of the same uh, uh, story. Now the web is much bigger, deeper, uh, global, and yet it is no longer the same web. So where has that magic moment gone? Well, I have to say, I think the magic is still there. You still can, just sort of with the click, go to so many sites and talk to people, do all of those things. The problem is it's not just the magic anymore. It's the commercial interests that I feel like have colonized our magical land, right? There's this colonization of what was for us, this beautiful place that we didn't think was for making money, but it is for making money. There's also, as it always happens with technologies, governments and other actors have stepped into this place and have exercised their power and their control over it. So it felt like when I first got on it, it felt like a place you escaped to. And right now, it's not a place you escape to because everything else in this world is its part of the world. So that's a big part of it. And finally, I would say that when I was there, I didn't really think of how everything, how every click and every sort of browser movement, the cursor movement I did, 
was being used to create a profile of me. And right now, every time I'm on the web, I have this distinct feeling I'm being watched. And that's a kind of chilling effect to the magic of feeling free. Because if you're being watched, you don't feel the same kind of freedom. That's, of course, the, the, the grand bargain of the web, right? You get free services, good services, cool services, useful services. And in exchange, you give your data without really thinking, thinking twice. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the deal on which the explosion of web services has been, has been, uh, has been built. Uh, I guess that asking you whether the companies that do this are too powerful is not really a difficult question. I don't think it's a good deal, to be honest, because I don't think that's even what we signed up for, because we don't even understand all the uses for this data. And there were so many alternative ways in which, rather than advertising, we could have financed all of this. I feel like rather than making a deal, we've kind of drifted toward this moment. So if it had been a deal that had been discussed and debated, and as certain was saying, like have some democ democratic dialogue between it and said, that's what we're going to do, that would be one thing. It's just we've been dragged here in the middle of a non-deal with all these downsides, and that's really what bothers me a lot. So uh, I have the impression, though, that uh, people like you and many others have actually pointed out these issues for years now. And I have the impression we are kind of coming to a sort of, of, of tipping point. There is uh, a lot of political pressure, uh, anything from more regulation to protection of data to breaking up companies, etc. Uh, there is a lot of better awareness in mm -hmm. people about what happens behind the screens. Are, are we kind of needing a moment where we feel that something may be turning? Well, I actually hate to be the pessimist here, but I'm actually, let me say it this way, I'm an optimist. I think we can do much better, but I'm not optimistic about the turning point. And it's almost in spite of GDPR, which is now in Europe, we have better privacy regulations, because all the current approaches we have depend on looking at data as something individual, and can we get people to consent? The problem is, if you need to connect with people, and if you're in Indonesia, and for a lot of places, and they're on Facebook, you're going to consent, because it's centralized. It's right there. Uh, if you need to sort of look up Google Maps, they're going to get our individual consent. And I think a lot of the well-meaning efforts have focused on empowering the user, which I'm all for. But I see the problem more like, say, something like lead in paint or pollution, where we don't care if you consent. We do not let you put lead in paint because the collective harm is bad. Or we don't say you just sign something in your car and then your car can pollute and go fast. We say, no, we don't do that. The problem with the web, most of the problems are not individual harms as much as collective harms. And collective harms are historically hard to get a handle on. I mean, look at climate change. It's another example of a collective harm that's very hard to get at. And I feel like we haven't reached a tipping point where we recognize the problem is not individual versus the company. It's society versus the way it's organized. And once we reach that, I think we'll have much better solutions. Right now, we're kind of still some looking at solutions, but I think we're looking under the light for our keys for the individual, but the keys aren't there, even though the light is there. So companies are also trying to change and take into account some of this criticism. Right? That just, just last week, uh, under pressure, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook announced that they're going to redesign all their services with privacy at their core. Uh, do you believe so that? Here's the problem with his proposal. Uh, he proposed to create more end-to-end -end encryption which is not a bad thing, without discussing at all the surveillance Facebook does on you, so the business model of surveillance, he wasn't mentioning that at all. I'm kind of like, you know, there's the house is on fire, and he's talking about he's going to mow the lawn better. I'm like, let's talk about the house on fire. That's the first problem. The second problem with his proposal was he wanted to integrate WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook Messenger, as a privacy move, that's not a privacy move, that's a move to make sure they can't be broken up because there's a lot of people now figuring out maybe they shouldn't have been allowed to buy all of these things. And the third problem is while encryption is a great tool for preserving privacy, 
for mass messaging and for like broadcasting stuff, end-to-end -end encryption can just mean Facebook washes its hands off content moderation of misinformation, hate speech, uh, incitement to violence, saying, well, we can't just read it. And that's not a good trade-off. That's just cost-cutting for Facebook. So I looked at it. I was hopeful. I was like, maybe they'll just do a real pivot. And what I instead saw, unfortunately, was a competitive entrenchment, an antitrust sort of defensive action, and a lowering of costs without a word about their business model. And this goes for Google, too. If you, we do not talk about how they make the, their money, it, we're just talking about like rounding errors uh, to the problem. So that's where we are. <laughs> I, I was just going to say just one thing. Yeah. I, I believe in the case of Facebook, uh, I believe Mark Zuckerberg said uh, several years ago that privacy was dead. Um, and he's so, not the only one saying so. I but, right? So, so let's not forget, you know, uh, what's happening here, whether or not there's veracity. Just what Zainab has been saying, yeah. uh, you know, the truth is in the pudding, right? Yeah. So, Monique, there are kind of two models of, of power at play, at play here. There is the Western model, which is about you know, surveillance for commercial goals, uh, essentially, which then can also be used for political uh, promotion. And then there is the, the Chinese model, the Chinese surveillance machine, which is more about social uh, control. When we, look at, when we look at those two models from a, the perspective of the individual, from a human, human perspective, are the problems the same, or are we facing two different kinds of problems here? I think the problems are the same. Uh, depends on the perspective, but in the end, you're looking at um, you're looking at, you know, what is the de definition of surveillance? Some, some entity is watching you. And, you know, um, now in some governments, maybe that's uh, something that is quote-unquote accepted. I'll put that in quotes because I have to be very, very careful. Uh, but in the other uh, instance, it's, it's what, is, what is watching you and, and who's watching the what or whom. And I think this is, a, this is the polarity that we're all, inv we're all involved in. This is why we are having this discussion. Uh, I think it's incredible that several years ago, uh, Eric Schmidt had once said at Google, uh, we all know your thoughts before you know them. Oh. We know your thoughts before you know them. So you're looking at an entire behavioral analytics that's going on, the whole in, in instance of profiling that's going on, and, and either we're going to have to be part of that story or put us back into the center of the universe, the Copernican universe as a human, or we're going to let stuff happen to us that we may regret. So how, how do we go after creating non-surveillance technologies? Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, technology, you know, there's no, is, is there a human agency in technology? I think it's more like, it's more what people do with it. This is the thing. Um, you know, when you have a pack of cigarettes, you can say, okay, these cigarettes could cause you cancer. You could actually define, for example, this is the intention, intentional use of a particular set of technology. But um, I think the, the, you were dealing with the human, human factor here in terms of there are always going to be interesting actors and players. Um, and I don't think it's, it's not just technology, it's what is done uh, on with the use of technology as a tool with with no you know remember it has no agency uh, but I do believe um, I do believe that we have to be very careful in defining the intentional use um, and I think that's probably something that as technologists we can do better so you you, you are head of an organization called the humanized internet mm -hmm. you're also writing a book uh, of the same title is going to come out yep. later this year uh, in general terms, what does a humanized internet look like? Well, you know, it's bringing the human back into the, <laughs> back into the internet. Uh, fundamentally, it goes to the narrative of can we have control of our digital identity? That's one. Uh, the other issue, and I'll put that in quotes, the other issue is about um, you know, caring about privacy uh, and putting sort of ethics, or having an ethics button involved in this whole discussion. Uh, it's not often uh, discussed. And so um, there is the, the, the uh, notion about centralization of these uh, particular organizations that's also described in the uh, abstract of the book. 
you know, we have to look at how we have a, at least a decentralization of what we're doing uh, in terms of, of, of whether it's technology, whether it's organizations and, and structures. So let me give you an example. This is a personal example. On my board is a person who is a refugee, mm -hmm. right? Um, so identity, it, there's a lot of empirical evidence in books about what identity is. There's your culture, that's what that's given to you by some, some government, etc. He was fleeing a government. And it didn't matter that he had all of his copies of his uh, documents on, on a Google Drive. It simply wasn't accepted. They wanted paper copies. So this is something that uh, was very, very disconcerting for him. And I think we need to look at, as we're in the second half of the 21st century, we have to look at what does digital identity mean? What is, what is, how do we give, when we're talking about sovereignty in itself, we're talking about governments, governments get involved, uh, what happens when you're fleeing a government and so on. We have to be able to actually put this in a narrative that is very, very positive. And let me just suggest, um, you know, I was just recently at the World Summit in Dubai, and we were talking uh, about artificial intelligence. You know, how do you put governance in the artificial intelligence model? There's a dystopian view about, um, about what that could look like. So I believe in social good, right? I think there, there, there is, a, when we're talking about climate change, uh, I believe what we do with technology has to have a social good aspect of it. It's not corporate social responsibility, it's simple social good and just makes sense for our society. So one, one technology that's kind of put on the table every time we talk about issues of decentralization of uh, uh, identity, et cetera, is blockchain. Uh, and it's seen as a, as a potential solution to many of those, of those issues. Do you see it that way? Uh, it could be. I mean, it's, it, it's one of several. I look at the example of uh, credentialing, mm -hmm. um, which we you know, have been working on with uh, some refugees and with some organizations, where you could actually look at how you provide credentialing as an example, that it would be forever there. If stuff happens in countries. It doesn't matter whether or not it's war or uh, whatever we do, if it's an earthquake uh, or it's a natural a disaster, you have to look at how do you have veracity in your, uh, or forever uh, look at credentialing, and that is low-hanging fruit, for example. Um, and so, you know, uh, these, are, these are something that we've been working around, uh, certificates, uh, MIT has been doing that. Uh, could we think about, we're trying to be creative in this world, and then I think that's, these are just examples of what we could do with these sets of technologies. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about some of that, but Doreen, I want to bring you in and, and jump to what Tim said towards the end of, uh, of the short discussion we had before about connecting the other half of uh, the world, because of course, uh, that's a name, but we cannot just give them the web we have, we have, we have uh, uh, now. Because in World Wide Web, there is sort of a, a hopeful lie, which is world. Uh, you know, we are roughly at a time now where 50, 51 percent of the world is connected. So you, the ITU is the UN agency charged with promoting ICT, promoting telecommunication links, uh, etc. And actually, that's your personal task as the head of, of the Telecommunication Development Bureau. What needs to be done to connect the other half? Um, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, so maybe first to start, I am also optimistic, and I think that we can, we can do better. Uh, and if you will allow me just for one second, um, now I think we're supposed to be in 1990, but I'm going to go back to 1989. Uh, I was an intern in the US government at the time. Um, but the ITU member states were meeting in Nice for the Plenipotentiary Conference, and they were looking uh, at connectivity. They had this report called the Missing Link Report, uh, and they understood that in 1989, only one out of 10 people had access to a fixed line telephone, uh, and one out of 100 to a mobile phone. Uh, and that was cause for alarm, and it made the member states then take the decision to actually create the development sector, which is, uh, as you mentioned, the bureau that I am now uh, leading. So fast forward, it's 2019, and as you mentioned, we have, uh, we have uh, hit the 50-50 milestone in, in December last year. Uh, so that's great. We have half the world that's connected, but it's not great because half the world uh, is not connected. 
And uh, I think it's very concerning, and I'm sure Jovan will comment on this as well. We have less than 11 years to achieve the 2030 agenda, the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, and we're not going to achieve any of those goals if we don't have global connectivity. So the urgency is there. Uh, and we can't wait another 30 years to get the other half of the world connected. So what do we need to do? Um, it's no longer business as usual. It's going to be much harder to get the other 50% online. Uh, we need new models for collaboration. Uh, we, need new, we need new regulatory approaches. We need infrastructure sharing. Uh, we need to rethink the way that we license services, universal service obligations. We need a whole new, uh, whole new thinking and a whole new paradigm. Give us, tell us where that other 50% is. Give us a cartography of the, of the other half. Yeah. So uh, most of the 50% that are not connected are um, in, in rural areas. They can be also urban poor, uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, women, by the way, are uh, disproportionately affected. There are fewer women online than men. Uh, so they are, uh, they are the harder to reach, uh, which means that we need to make extra efforts to get to them. And when I say extra efforts, we need to keep in mind that on the content side, uh, we need to pay attention to that because just dumping on them what's there currently on the web is not enough. Uh, so we need to work harder on stimulating the demand side uh, and making sure that appropriate, relevant content in, in local languages is there. When we talk about the other half, we don't talk only about emerging countries. We also talk about pockets in developed countries, yeah. North America and Europe as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, even in the United States, I'm the chairman of the FCC who was recently at Mobile World Congress two weeks ago, uh, and he was speaking about uh, absolutely that, that there are pockets within my own country that are not connected. So what, what are the biggest stumbling blocks? Uh, you said we need to speed up the process. Uh, what do we need to get out of the way to speed up the process? Yeah. Um, so regulatory approaches have, uh, have a lot to play. Uh, affordability, uh, and Tim mentioned that as well. Yeah. Uh, so we need to get the infrastructure there, and there's a cost, of course, to getting the infrastructure there. Uh, but then we also need to make sure that the services are affordable uh, and that the devices are also affordable. So we, before we Zenab talked, we talked about Facebook, and uh, uh, we have been criticizing big companies because of data extraction, etc. But most of them have also developed projects towards this this goal. Uh, you know, getting connectivity to rural area through uh, drones and satellite networks, uh, giving basic access to to users. Facebook had this you no know, Facebook basic uh, project, uh, which was. A, adopted in some countries, next in others. In India, they kind of went up in an uproar against it, and it never happened. Uh, what do you make of these private companies' efforts towards this goal? So I would say that the private companies, there's a huge potential for good, and a lot of them are, are trying to do just that. Uh, I, I've just come back from Mauritius, where last week we had a global forum on emergency telecommunications. So we were looking at disaster situations from natural disasters uh, to humanitarian disasters, refugee crisis, uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, and those companies were there with us. We had Google Loon, we had Facebook, uh, we had a number of satellite providers, uh, we had uh, OneWeb, and we were talking about what can we do in those situations. Uh, and in those situations, it is the, um, the current and the future technologies that are going to help us uh, to manage quickly uh, when an emergency, when emergency situation strikes. Uh, Monique, this week here in Geneva, we are running the International Film Festival on Human Rights, and uh, tonight we are actually going to have a joint session at, uh, at CERN. When we talk of vulnerable groups, group of people, you mentioned refugees uh, before. We seem to see an explosion in data-driven applications that are aimed at them. Do you see that as good or, problem or problematic? I see it as problematic. We have to be very, very careful. These are people who are, I mean, I've been to Jordan, I've been to the camps. These are people who are fleeing very, very um, awful situations. So if you're using technologies um, to 
to potentially uh, profile them in a, in a way that they're not uh, familiar with, that is, uh, that is a potential danger in itself. I should also point out um, that the internet, uh, the IETF, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, has a, a group, an Internet Research Task Force, that is working on the Human Rights Protocol, which is interesting. I'm not sure if you know about that. No, I didn't. Well, there you go. So now you know. Uh, it's, it's a very important uh, that because they're very, very concerned. And also this whole notion of algorithmic decision making and human rights. So with vulnerable people, we have to be very, very careful. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about some uses of technology, which, is, which may be used against them. Um, and you have to think about what would happen if we were back in 1938 and you had the Nazi time and how these technologies can be used in, in, in such, it's not too far back in the future, by the way, uh, in a way that could be uh, very, very dangerous. And so um, I, 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 am, I am concerned about that. That's just one thing I will say without pointing out examples. Okay. Uh, b because I, and there are some examples that we have to be concerned uh, to look at. How technology is being used to profile these people? How against that they're, they're not aware of it? That's the whole but thing. But to go back to the point of consent, this is even you know, one. But they're step not aware of it. The That's road. the concern. Yes. That is the concern. Exactly, uh, Yovan. There is a, a geopolitical dimension to, to, to this whole discussion. Maybe even a, a, a techno geopolitical uh, dimension. I mentioned before you you uh, are the executive director of the Secretariat of the United Nations High Level Panel of on digital cooperation. Uh, and the key word is cooperation here, but I have the impression of actually, rather than cooperation, seeing a beginning of a potential fracturing of the, of the internet. Uh, China is developing its own approach. Uh, it's an alternative to Western technology. Other countries are kind of starting to potentially adopt it. Uh, there are you know, different approaches to technology, to policy, to standards. Russia is probing ways to cut itself off the internet. India is thinking about similar things. Uh, is the internet going to remain one, or are we going to see kind of different uh, islands with different standards connected with toll bridges? Mm. 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 <laughs> well, this is a question. Um, first of all, internet um, uh, is one technologically, but internet has never been one uh, when it comes to practical use and impact on society. Mm -hmm. uh, internet is technological uh, artifact. It can be connected uh, all over the world, but the way how internet is used all over the world is different. And I'll give you one concrete example related to our previous discussion on privacy and data. You have privacy concern in Europe which are shaped by mainly difficult tw uh, 20th century and. Uh, and uh, there are concerns re related to individual privacy and uh, protecting of our uh, sort of um, individual or family space. When you come to other regions, there are other concerns. For example, African Convention, the only cyber convention which was adopted in Africa, has in its title African Convention on Protection of Privacy and Security. It was adopted five years ago, and it was a quite visionary because it linked two aspects which we are now discussing, mm -hmm. privacy and security. When I discussed with colleagues in Africa why they uh, connected that, the answer was very simple. Privacy in the crisis situation, especially in tribal conflicts, on the inter-religious inter conflicts, was a matter of life and death. Therefore, you have comp if you have the same value, protection of privacy, differently perceived in uh, Europe, differently perceived in Africa, Asia, all over the world. Then what we have to understand when we try to keep internet unified and, and force for good, for prosperity, is that internet is differently perceived all over the world. And this is the main challenge, how to preserve unique, unified technological in, uh, infrastructure, recognize differences, and make cooperation between different spaces, socio-cultural spaces that are emerging. But then the question is really at the base, at, at, at the base of this, how to keep the technology the same, right? Because if you start having separate standards, then it's inevitable that we're going to have separate everything. 
so my impression is, for example, that the current discussion about 5G and Huawei, etc., is not really a trade issue. It's more an issue of who is going to control the standards for 5G in the world. Uh, do, you, do you see it that way, or do you see it differently? Well, obviously, there is a battle for standards. And uh, in a way, we are discussing here one important standard, which is HTML. Yeah. And by the way, I would like to congratulate Sir not only for the World Wide Web, but also for cloud computing. It is sometimes forgotten that quite a few technologies which are now empowering the cloud computing True. were developed in this place. True. And we are getting something new coming from sensors, but I'm sure our uh, colleagues and friends tell, tell us more, about, more on it. Now, standards are important. Standards have a, have a political power, mm -hmm. and the standards influence how the uh, internet is, is, uh, is shaped. Now, I'm a bit more optimistic when it comes to decentralization uh, based on the appreciation of interdependence that exists today. Starting from grandmas, I'm originally from the Balkans, mm -hmm. who are connect, uh, connected to their families uh, across the ocean, to the businesses, uh, individuals, and people who rely on the internet. This is enormous power which will put the pressure on decision makers, businesses, and others to keep internet integrated. Therefore, that interdependence element uh, is sometimes uh, underestimated, and it can be realized at the point where the internet is cut. And we, can, we cannot use it as part of our daily routine. Therefore, that's sort of optimistic aspect when it comes to the push and realistic power, not just the nominal, the question of values, what we would like to have, but when, when we come to the bottom line of interest of businesses, individuals, and governments. So when we spoke a few days ago, you told me something interesting about the notion of optimization. Uh, and choice. Basically, the idea that uh, web and all the technologies that are built on top of it were supposed to give us more choice. And impartially, they did give us more choice to create, to inform ourselves, to connect, uh, etc. But then, uh, as technology kept developing, we started looking at how to optimize technology. And optimization is a response to a technological need and not to a human need. So it kind of bumps against choice. Can you elaborate a little bit on, 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 on that? Sure. Yeah. Well, we're revisiting basically two pillars on enlightenment era, which, which is behind modernity and, uh, and our age. One is, one is possibility of making choices, individual choices, mm -hmm. business choices, and political choices. And second, the idea of more modernity than enlightenment is the idea of optimization and efficiency. Therefore, these two ideas are now, uh, to some extent, colliding we may have less choices because uh, machines and artificial intelligence uh, platforms will optimize the, uh, the, give us advices based on enormous data, knowing us better than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. Therefore, sooner or later, underlying political and social questions on society will be this reconciliation of interplay between choice as basis of our freedom and the idea of optimization, which is the basis of modernity. Therefore, while we are progressing in political discussion, addressing data, privacy, ultimately this will be the end conceptual point that, which we'll have to address sooner or later. And Geneva is, uh, I would say, the right place where throughout the history, uh, technology used to meet humanity. Whenever technology was accelerating and pos posing challenges, there was a point where the important discussions were held in Geneva to reconcile these dynamics between possibilities, what can be done, which is in a way Silicon Valley or California yeah. logic, and in a way what should be done, which is more humanity aspect, which is discussed in Geneva, all over the place within humanitarian sector, human rights sector, and other places. Therefore, in a way, Geneva is the place where technology meets humanity. Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, the authorities in Geneva are very keen in becoming that, that place. I was Monique, you say, wanted to add yeah, something. So I was going to say, uh, look, it's the dignity of choice at the end yeah. of the day. Right? It's the dignity of choice. And going back to standards, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Doreen knows me very well <laughs> because I was a rapporteur and I've been involved in most of the standards groups. I think that uh, st there is this notion of standardization that is coming together. I mean, this, we call it harmonization, which is, which, is, which is fantastic. As to your politically driven question, uh, which was purposely done to, to stimulate the discussion and people are pivoting on that, uh, you know, look, it's... Um, 
I would say going back to 5G and who owns 5G, et cetera, I, I think we need to look at uh, how, we, uh, how we sort of work, to, work together on, on what that will look like. Uh, I actually uh, chaired a cybersecurity days of Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, and there were discussions about do you have a, cent a central, uh, a neutral authority, that a neutral group that is looking at what's happening with these, uh, with these particular vendors. Uh, do you have that? Is that something that we should be looking at? Do you have some notion of certification? Um, you know, what that would be, uh, and so on. I think we can have creative discussions. But let me just say one thing about the internet, because Doreen knows I was involved in some of these discussions. Uh, there were people from various nation states who were saying, hey, look, the internet was a DARPA experiment. Uh, you know, coming out of the United States Defense Group. So why should we trust it? So there were lots of lots of very, very hard discussions on the internet uh, and its origins. But I think uh, I, I am, every, you know, there's optimism. I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon public, private uh, groups and citizens, netizens, to work together. So one, one of my, my um Impressions is that uh, the key notion here that people, general public, have a hard time understanding is the notion of data, uh, and, and 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 the way everything is structured around data. And we think that data is basically our name, our address, our phone number, our uh, birth date, but it's actually much more and 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 uh, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, there are a lot of new technologies that are coming our way now. Artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, blockchain, uh, self-driving cars, uh, cryptocurrencies, etc. And uh, they all seem to be built on the idea of accumulating even more data. Uh, so the, 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 maybe the thing we need to change is the way we look at data. So. I just want to also pick up on something that I think is very crucial here, is that the project of modernity is partly a project of social control, right? The nation state is a way of making things controllable in lots of ways. And I think what we're seeing with the data and with everything, especially now with artificial intelligence, is that we're seeing tools of social control be built on top of the internet technology. It's a way of making us, measuring us as consumers, using artificial intelligence to figure out what shall we watch on YouTube to keep us there. It's a way, in China, it's an explicit model of social control that's built on the digital technologies. And it goes back to having all our data to make us legible to the powers to be able to not just watch us, but to shape what we do. And in the right, normal, you know, sort of modernity, the idea at least is that since it's the state project, the state is supposed to be accountable to us. And that social controls comes with public health and all the other stuff, and there are things we say no. This is not where we want the social control, which is exactly that trade-off, that tension we're talking about right now. I feel like we have none of that trade-off being discussed. We have all our data being collected in all sorts of ways that, as you say, I don't think people understand at all. Your phone, the browser sends your phone number, not just your data. It has a gyroscope, so have you been walking a lot? You know, Your Apple Watch has your heart rate. There's this enormous amount of inferential data. Your Instagram pictures, the colors, can predict if you're about to become more depressed. There's ways that we don't understand that we are being measured using artificial intelligence and then prodded and shaped without the trade-off we made with building states in that they would be accountable to us, the power of social control is being built by forces that aren't accountable to us. And I know everybody likes to talk about China as the sort of terrible example, but the same technologies, very similar ideas of social control. Just yesterday, I was reading about an app that's supposed to predict who's a potential shoplifter. It's going to look at your facial recognition. It's going to recognize, using AI, the emotion. It's can, you can look at people's face and measure their heart rate. You can figure out if they're about to have a stroke. There's all these things, and they're going to be in every capillary of every sort of corporate 
sort of interaction with us and the state to also control us. Maybe it won't be like the Chinese one, we won't have a Chinese Communist Party, but almost worse, there will be so diffused that we won't have a way to know how do we get at it, which is why it's so important to have this discussion. And I'll stop there because I think it starts with cutting off the data that feeds this beast. We're going to yeah. talk about that at the end. So yes. let's, let's so hold that I'm thought. I'm going to pick up on yes. this. Um, so, so, uh, this is, this is so cool, this, is, uh, this discussion. I mean, look, uh, it, it really is. Uh, we're being, how many of you have seen the movie The Minority Report? I mean, we're already I guess there. Much everybody. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so uh, you're, pro you're predicted for a future crime. That's all of this is happening now. To your point, it's not about nation states. And, and a lot of it is good, right? But, but yeah, it, there is there is some. Look, there is some. So in, I was in an exercise. It is that is the polarity we're dealing yeah. with. I was in an exercise in Dubai, uh, the World um, Government Summit, and um, with a, a particular group, and it was, it was this following narrative. It's uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and it's 50% global unemployment. Let's start with that. 50% global unemployment, what do you do? So my, my colleague, who's a Chinese professor, who was sitting to my left, said, well, that's pretty good. Everybody is now gonna be happy. They can do things. Uh, my colleague from Kinshasa was, was appalled because she's concerned about what, what does this mean for the so-called states that are quote, end quote, developed. One colleague said, may maybe we should start colonizing Mars earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one actually talked about something very dystopian about assisted death. So the whole point was, you know, looking at these fractured societies with what's happening in, in, in this world where, uh, you know, you have artificial intelligence. This is about a dystopian view of artificial intelligence, by the way. And, and, and how we measure what, what are the economics, uh, economics and values and, and value uh, that we use. And the, the narrative was they're, they're, the systems that we know today are creaking. And that's something that we need to be cognizant they are of. They're creaking. Creaking. Yeah. They're kind of, kind of breaking bit. up slowly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, human. Just one, one point in this discussion, which is extremely important, is the clarity. We discussed, Zainab mentioned clarity about how the Facebook and Google make money. Companies are established to make a money, to make a profit. They're, that's their function. We cannot expect from them, if they do good, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But they're, made, they're established to make a money. Governments are established from the basis of social contract to protect public interest market, democracy, uh, freedom, prevent anarchy ac according to the, to the, all the theories. Civil society is established to make a noise, to, put, uh, to keep other guys accountable that they do their functions. What we are fundi finding in international uh, relations and governance is complete confusion. Everybody is doing everything. And uh, that clarity of the function is extremely important. Also, clarity in our deal with the Google. We are using ex enormously powerful uh, services. That services have to come against some compensation. The problem is the deal is not transparent. Mm -hmm. But those deals have to be much more clear. If we bring a clarity in discussion about our role, role of governments, role of businesses, it is the first step to start, uh, in a way, controlling overall discussion. So how do we bring the clarity back? Uh, through regulation, through philosophy, how do we bring it back? Well, uh, you mentioned philosophy. I've been traveling last six months in my, this new role, and what was very interesting is that societies are getting back to their philosophical roots. Because it's not any more discussion on the, about the cables or TCPIP, or uh, those are questions about love, fear, hope, the core values of society. In China, we had fascinating discussion on Confucianism and Lao Tse and, and the internet. Uh, in Europe, well, we can consult a lot from the Voltaire and Rousseau and other thinkers. Therefore, there is that going back to the roots of the society because issues are fundamental. They're not just technological issues. How to do it against the clarity, what Zeynep mentioned, states are established through the social contract to protect the public interest. And frankly speaking, I'm seeing many states being in a way afraid to, 
to uh, be more assertive in protecting the uh, private interest that they should do. They're established for that purpose. Therefore, those are the key building blocks. Some regulations are needed. I'm an international lawyer by training, and I'm not particularly enthusiastic about treaties, because I know the limits of treaties and the uh, limit of usability. There are possibilities to have a smart solutions, to, to listen, to engage, to have some sort of sandboxes, to try to receive the feedback, but always with the clarity, not with the tech ideology and uh, this naive idea that technology is a solution for all problems. That's the key. Doreen, you wanted to add something? Yeah, well, maybe first on the point of clarity, I think we never would have imagined the impact that digital would have on our lives. And when we look at the UN system, for example, we never imagined that we would be where we are today so we don't have one entity that's responsible for digital. And I think that's one of the challenges that Jovan is looking at in the panel. And digital cr cuts across everything. And when we look for a perfect model, I think every stakeholder has a role to play um, in looking at how to uh, have sort of the best structures for our digital future. Um, but on the, the points that Zeynep and uh, Monique were mentioning before, I mean, of course, we need to be concerned about, uh, about protecting our data, about privacy, uh, about ethics. Um, those concerns are, are real, and we need to deal with them. But we also have to remember, going back to what I said before, half the world's not connected. Uh, and those unconnected people need health care. They need education. They need to be banked. And the only way that they're going to get there uh, is through access to the World Wide Web, through connectivity. Uh, and so while we deal with these very challenging, difficult issues, we also at the, at the same time need to figure out ways that we can get to the unconnected. So it's also a question of you know, national governments, global web, uh, a lack of jurisdiction, uh, etc. Some people are putting forward the idea that we need new global institutions to do some of this. For example, Amy Webb of NYU said we need uh, the, the uh, AI equivalent of the International Atomic Energy Agency that has at the same time a sort of uh, a regulatory role and also some level of capacity to enforce. Uh, what kind of institutions do we need to, 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 to go after these problems? Maybe you went first. Well, uh, the first, uh, before we establish new uh, institution or invent something new, we have to see how to use existing institutions. For example, most of the AI regulation, current regulation, could be done within the existing human rights system question of privacy, question of freedom of expression, uh, disabilities, data protection, data as a source of AI. Therefore, there are a lot of possibilities to use existing instruments. There are some niches where you need some sort of coordination. And one of the areas is that digital is cross-cutting. It doesn't stop on the policy silos, while our decision-making is still in silos. And I'll give you one example around data. Data is discussed in Geneva, in five to six organizations, mostly in the silos. is discussed in Human Rights Councils at Human Rights Issue, in World Trade Organization as e-commerce issue, in Standardization Organization, ISO, ITU as mainly standardization issue. Therefore, you have the uh, same issue, casting, uh, uh, cutting across different silos, discussed basically from very particular uh, uh, focus. And then decisions that are made are suboptimal, because you can discuss in WHO something on the data and health, mm -hmm. but then you have to consult what's going on in Human Rights Council related to privacy. Therefore, this is a real challenge, how to make this is one challenge. And second challenge is how to deal with acceleration of technology. Yeah. We had fake news in the past. We had a crime in the past. We had uh, more or less all phenomena that we are experiencing now, they existed in the past. But huge difference is acceleration. And that's, those are, I would say, two possible tasks for possible new framework. How to deal with the cross-cutting nature of the issues and how to deal, with especially with crisis management when it comes to acceleration. Yeah. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes left. And I want to go back to your point about uh, data and cutting off the collection of data. Because I mean, we are, we are here because of a magical moment of innovation that happened 30 years ago. Uh, and, and now it seems that almost all of the innovation that's happening is based purely on the gathering of massive amounts of data. 
And when we spoke recently, you told me something very interesting about, well, maybe there is another way of looking at innovation. So tell us about that. So a lot of what we see, like what Facebook, Google, and all these big companies are doing is machine learning. And machine learning basically is a way it churns through your data and comes up ways of classification. So you're not giving it instructions, you're just feeding it and you're kind of training it, you're raising it. Now, to me, it's very potent. It's uncannily effective. And it's also great, like you can read pap smears with greater accuracy, so this is a nice technology. Uh, but, of course, if you've got a technology that needs to eat data to work, you're going to have a surveillance infrastructure. It's kind of like you've got oil now, and it's very cheap, and people are creating these total gas guzzler cars and polluting the planet. So my idea there, from talking with a lot of technical people and following it, is that there are ways that machine learning could work that would be the equivalent of green technologies. There are ways they could work on encrypted data. There are ways it could work federated. So we could have an enormous amount of the benefits we have without um, having the surveillance. Or for example, let's say I'm a hospital, you're a hospital, we have pap smear data, and because of privacy regulations, we can't merge them and have a great diagnostic system. So it's not just the surveillance side, it's all the good stuff. But if oil is really cheap, who's going to develop solar panels? If oil is really cheap, who's going to put emission controls if nobody Basically what cares? you're saying, because we can easily access and yes. grab all this data, there is a lot of innovation that's not happening, which and is non-data driven Not innovation. only is it not happening, it's also polluting our world with this control and the surveillance, because once that data is built about me, governments are gonna come for it. There's, they're going there in China, they're already trying to pick out potential dissidents using big data analysis. So once data is collected, the potential of misuse is great. So give me a magic wand, I will cut off, no consent, none of this, a huge amount of the data collection, unless there's a very solid positive use, would make data collection the exception. And then we would unleash enormous amount of innovation. They would come up with our version of the solar panel, the emission control, you know, the seat belts and airbags and safety stuff. But because the governments aren't doing their job and stepping up, because all the institutions are kind of like, oh, technology, this is great, this will be great. We're not having these conversations. We're cutting off an alternative, wonderful, innovative path where we still have the cool stuff but not like all these downsides. And that's why I think it's important to have these conversations and say, this isn't inevitable, and let's do this other path. And that'd be much better for all of us. So we just got the preview of Zenep's next column in New York Times. <laughs> uh, please help me thank Zenep, Monique, Johan, and Doreen. to Bruno Giussani and all Please. our panelists for this Please. jump into the future of what has been an incredible journey so far. Sure. And as we near the end Thank of this you. morning's journey, um, I'm really pleased to welcome our Director for International Relations, Charlotte Varacola, to say a few closing words. Charlotte. Uh, to all of you for being with us for what has really been an incredible morning. It's very much a privilege to be able to close this event, but also quite a daunting task because it is, of course, impossible to, to follow such brilliant speakers and brilliant panels and no closing remarks can really do their interventions justice. It has often been said that it's difficult to imagine uh, a world without the web, and there it was before us just 30 years ago, and it was really fantastic to be transported back with Sir Tim and his fellow web pioneers, sharing with us the vision of the time of a world of seamless connectivity that has become the world of the web that we know today. As we heard this morning, in 1989, it was not immediately obvious to Sir Tim's contemporaries uh, that his, what he called a relatively simple idea would go on to change the world and how we are connected so radically. And luckily, of course, for Sir Tim and for all of us, his boss, Mike Sindel, at the time eventually created the space 
for him to work, and in time, others saw and embraced the vision of an open, democratic tool that would allow uh, the free flow of ideas and creativity around the world. Indeed, the web has delivered all of that, but as we also heard as the morning progressed, it has developed in multiple, sometimes disturbing ways as well. And session two gave us a very unique insight into the current preoccupation of the web's inventor and his initiatives now to give us the web that we want and I think also that we deserve before he left to embark on his very symbolic 30-hour journey that will take him eventually to uh, Lagos. But before leaving, Sir Tim spoke of his concerns about the direction of the web and how it, the, web, the direction it has taken and how he is working personally with many uh, to bring it back to the original democratic vision in which everybody can generate content as well as read, uh, in which everyone owns and controls their own data. And he expressed concern, as we heard, that we need to get the half of the world's population that is not yet online connected in a space that is fair, through a new contract for the web. So the creator of the web is now creating a movement to save, to defend the web that we have. And then, to conclude, we were very fortunate to have with us four, plus one, uh, leading digital visionaries reflecting on the opportunities and challenges of the web of today and uh, tomorrow. And I really would like to thank all of them. From them we learned about the challenges that we face um, today, the challenges that arrive, that arise, as Zainab was saying so eloquently, from what actually makes the web so wonderful, its very openness, and this is also what is our challenge. And the problems, as we learned, are very much collective, they're not individual. Uh, it's the ease uh, with which the web can be used for surveillance, either for commercial or for political ends. The different perceptions of the web across the world, also a challenge. Uh, it was a quite worrying conversation in parts, but also one that had an optimistic thread going uh, through it because there is a growing recognition of the problems that we face with the web today and also a growing movement to, uh, to solve them, though we may not necessarily have reached tipping point, as Zainab pointed out earlier. So all that remains for me is to, uh, to thank all of our panelists for their insights, thank Bruno for his absolutely excellent moderation and for challenging our panelists, of course very much to our partners in organizing this event, the W3C, the Web Foundation, thank you for working with us. Thanks also to the web developers we saw earlier who have given us all the chance to experience the web as it was at the very beginning, along with the US Mission and the Cerner Society Foundation for supporting that very unique initiative. And of course, a huge and a very warm thank you to the organizing team who have worked so hard to bring this event together. And last but not least, thank you to all of you for being with us today, to all of those who followed us around the world in different time zones. Thank you all and let us wish Sir Tim and all those working with him every success in taking forward the vision and the idealism of 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. As Sir Tim embarks on his 30-hour journey, marking 30 years of the World Wide Web, our own journey continues today with other events later on. This afternoon at 4 p.m. CET, an Ask Me Anything session will take place on Reddit, in which the web pioneers and experts will be answering questions from all around the world. This will be followed by the celebration at the Science Museum in London at 6 p.m., which you can follow by West webcast. And the day will end here, in the globe of science and innovation, with a screening of the documentary entitled For Everyone, tracing the history of the web, and ending with a panel discussion, which you can also follow by webcast. This will be in French. Thank you all for having followed the Web at CERN event today, the Web at 30 at CERN event today, wherever you were, an event organized in partnership with the Web Foundation and W3C. This recording will be made available on the website, along with the URL of the first web browser, the full sonification of the first proposal, and many more resources for you to continue building your own voyage with the web. Thank you very much, and goodbye.
distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, a very warm welcome also from my end to you all. And thank you for being with us today for this very special event to mark the 30th anniversary of the original proposal of the World Wide Web. That the story of the web highlights the power of fundamental research to drive innovation. Basic science, with its ambitious goals, brings cutting-edge technological development in many areas and can impact society in a profound way. The web has been an incredible and powerful tool to reach out to the whole humanity, to break down barriers, to bring education and information to all, and thus to reduce inequalities. This spirit of openness is one of CERN's core values, one that we strongly defend as we continue to promote the open sharing of what we develop and produce, software, hardware, data, scientific publication, for the benefit of science and of society in general. Without that core value, we will not have the open and free web that we are here to celebrate today. What was the big vision behind this? It was hypertext and the internet sort of coming together, which, which seemed to be uh, a relatively, relatively simple idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and I think as, once you've seen the possibility of all of these things being part of one big, like one big book, then it's just frustrating. Then just, you know, what can, can be um, motivated when you can visualize what it could be like. Exactly. And it hasn't happened yet. You just have to keep working on it. There were indeed uh, a lot of systems out there, and there were quite a lot of uh, much more advanced hypertext systems as well, but they were all confined to a single machine. Bill? Well, perhaps just the idea that, that it went over a worldwide network, that it was, the network was sort of secondary to it, but it, it was everywhere. Okay. It was not proprietary also, which was very important. I agree. Staying with you, uh, just one sentence. Yes. What would you tell the next generation about how to use this wonderful tool? One sentence. So my one sentence to next generation is if you have something wonderful, if you do not defend it, you will lose it. If you do not defend the magic and the things that make it wonderful, it's just not going to stay magical by itself. Thank you. Working on the web gave me something to believe in, something to be part of that was bigger than myself. And I would say to everyone out there looking for something, engage in something bigger than yourself. Believe in something and you can change the world. We didn't think we would change the world in a social way, but we, we did believe this would get big. It, it went even bigger than we imagined, and uh, I'm forever grateful for having been here by chance at the right time. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, uh, uh, get off it and save the planet. <laughs> I'm so surprised. Save the planet. We have, no, we have only one important thing to do, that is to save our planet. That's, that's the biggest problem that we have to deal with and yes. the web can help that and I was very uh, confident that uh, it would be a good tool to, to do so and to bring people together and, and in a sense it is of course but we're not doing enough for this paramount problem that we're seeing and, and that, that I think is much more important than, than anything including this whole session yeah. unfortunately. Okay. So yes climate change is important uh, and a lot of the a lot of the things we have big massive challenges uh, like finding cures for cancer and understanding Alzheimer's and so on and these the, these challenges we should be able to use the web for we should, you know, the idea was that it should be a big collaborative medium which will allow us to do science do re do peer review do uh, go through processes like Wikipedia processes, which end up producing not perfection, but pretty, but, but things which are really, really uh, amazingly good. When, when did you realize that it was time for you to kind of step back and take a second look at your creation? Uh, you have to check the quote, but I think what I said was we have to be careful. Uh, we need to constantly be analyzing the web. And you launched several years ago into a project to re-decentralize the web. Tell us about what does, what, what does it mean, re-decentralizing the web? So how can you imagine a world in which it's decentralized, we don't have to rely on a centralized database? Uh, so imagine that we have a world where 
you are running apps, you're running web, web apps, or they can be other apps. You can be managing your photos, managing your contacts, managing your calendar, uh, your whatever list. it is, and, imagine, and the data, instead of you combine the user-generated content idea of being able to input value to the system with the everybody has their own web page, idea, website, website idea, and so you say, yes, I will generate the data, but it'll go onto my website. So, so that is the uh, that's a sort of that, that that's the idea behind seeing them. Where is the balance uh, b between freedom of speech and, and hate speech, things like uh, things like that? So it's a the contract is it's not a written in stone thing. The contract for the web uh, phenomenon is one of people signing, uh, saying, yes, I think, I, I think this stuff is important and I want to be involved with the discussions to work out the details. Well, I have to say, I think the magic is still there. You still can just sort of with the click go to so many sites and talk to people, do all of those things. The problem is it's not just the magic anymore. It's the commercial interests that I feel like have colonized our magical land, right? There's this colonization of what was for us, this beautiful place that we didn't think was for making money. I believe Mark Zuckerberg said several years ago that privacy was dead. I mean, technology, you know, there's no, is, is there a human agency in technology? I think it's more like, it's more what people do with it. This is the thing. So fast forward, it's 2019, and as you mentioned, we have, uh, we have uh, hit the 50-50 milestone in, in December last year. Uh, so that's great. We have half the world that's connected, but it's not great because half the world uh, is not connected. So fast forward, it's 2019, and as you mentioned, we have... Uh, we have uh, hit the 50-50 milestone in, in December last year. Uh, so that's great. We have half the world that's connected, but it's not great because half the world uh, is not connected. So uh, most of the 50% that are not connected are um, in, in rural areas. They can be also urban poor, uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, women, by the way, are uh, disproportionately affected. There are fewer women online than men. Uh, so they are, uh, they are the harder to reach. Is the internet going to remain one, or are we going to see kind of different uh, islands with different standards connected with toll bridges? Mm. <laughs> well, this is a question. Um, first of all, internet... Um, uh, is one technologically, but internet has never been one uh, when it comes to practical use and impact on society. Mm -hmm. uh, internet is technological uh, artifact. It can be connected uh, all over the world, but the way how internet is used all over the world is different. Internet is differently perceived all over the world. And this is the main challenge, how to preserve unique, unified technological in uh, infrastructure, recognize differences, and make cooperation between different spaces, socio-cultural spaces that are emerging. 